two, and then on. Talking. On.
The joint here. The joint hearing on the subcommittee on health, employment, labor and pensions and a subcommittee on higher education and workforce development will come to order. I note that a quorum is present without objection. The chair is authorized to call a recess at any time. Like most Americans, I love college athletics. I enjoy supporting my alma mater, Liberty University, where I worked in athletics administration for 15 years and who I might add had an undefeated regular season in football and played in the Fiesta Bowl recently. As is typical in the Biden administration, the National Labor Relations Board wants to take something we all love, hyper-regulate it, and make it more expensive. Today's hearing will examine the consequences of the NLRB's misguided efforts to classify student athletes as employees of the university they attend. Already, an unelected bureaucrat, the NLRB, deemed the men's basketball team at Dartmouth College to be employees. In another case, the NLRB general counsel is pushing a theory that the NCAA and the Pac-12 conference are joint employers of student athletes. This is ridiculous and will expose institutions to massive new liabilities and much higher costs. Employee status will hurt student athletes too as they will have less freedom, lower educational standards, and revoked or even tax scholarships if they become employees. I was fortunate to wrestle during my time at Liberty, so I know some of the benefits and challenges of being an NCAA student athlete. Like 98% of student athletes, at the end of my five years, I went pro in something other than my sport. I retired from the wrestling mat and embarked on a 17-year professional career in finance using the degree, the degree that I worked to obtain. Years later, I returned to Liberty University and served as the senior athletic, athletics director, uh, given my, uh, the senior associate athletics director. Given my experience on both sides of this issue, I know that the majority of student athletes and the schools will be harmed by this proposed change. Student athletes don't want to deal with union dues and employment contracts. The last thing colleges need is to have to hire more administrators to deal with more federal regulations. I believe we can find ways to protect the interests of student athletes and their universities without distorting their relationship and changing the nature of college athletics. And I look forward to today's discussion. I now yield to the ranking member of the Health, Employment, Labor, and Pensions Subcommittee for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. The labor movement delivered our nation's most necessary protections for workers, including minimum wage, workplace safety laws, and the five-day work week. This shifted power from unscrupulous employers, not all employers, who profit off the backs of workers to giving employees an opportunity to join together for higher wages, better benefits, safer workplaces, and protect themselves and their families. As much as I enjoy reminiscing about my days in college, in college athletics, I can't remember that much about it, but I vaguely remember leather helmets, um, <laughs> without face masks, by the way. The world of college sports is vastly different now than it was then. Today, the collegiate sports industry rakes in billions of dollars, yet college college sports industry rakes in billions of dollars, such college athletes, who are the reason the industry is so popular, do not fully share in this profitable industry. And at the same time, many college athletes who explored and lack, who are exploited and lack basic health and safety protections. Some have even experienced food insecurity and homelessness. Against this backdrop, college athletics, athletics are understandably looking for ways to level the playing field and gain a more equal voice. That's what this is about, and we should keep that front and center during today's hearing. The world's changed in many ways, and certainly changed when myself and the chairman, although he was more recent than I, were participating in college athletics. So we have to understand that reality, and I think that's what all of us are grappling with here today. The Dartmouth men's basketball team recently came together and voted to form a union, and they were found to be eligible to do that by the National Labor Relations Board. They are trying to ensure that they can advocate for safer playing conditions, among other priorities. Contrary to what we hear today, their efforts do not mean the end of college athletics, and the sky is not falling. Even conservative Trump-appointed Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh agrees and two years ago, he said, the NCAA business, this is a quote, the NCAA business model would be flatly illegal in almost any other industry in the United States. And he continued, quotes, college and student athletes 
could potentially engage in collective bargaining or seek some other negotiated agreement to provide student athletes a fair share of the revenues that they generate for their colleges, end quote, Justice Kavanaugh. Similar to athletes at other NCAA uh, Ivy League schools, Dartmouth players only receive need-based scholarships. And while the team generates a considerable amount of revenue for their university, players have no say in their practice schedules, manage part-time jobs, to, and manage part-time jobs to pay their bills and pay high out-of-pocket costs for serious injuries from practice and games. Athletes should be treated like people, not just sources of revenue for their colleges and universities. We should stand with them and help them get the support they need in this new world of college athletics. I hope we can have a real and meaningful conversation today and not have this hearing turn into an attack on labor unions. I, yield, I now yield to Mr. Owens for an opening statement. Thank you. The world of college sports is in a transformative period. In 2021, the Supreme Court decided NCAA versus Alston and ushered in college sports into a new era of name, image, and likeness compensation, or NIL for short. Student athletes have also gained newfound freedom to transfer schools freely. But at its core, college sports is about enhancing the student athlete academic experience and molding young people into productive citizens. All this could be lost if the radical Biden NLBR B, uh, R, R, B, has its way. The Biden NLRB is the most active, activist pro union uh, government agency in history. It has taken this opportunity to declare student athletes to be employees. At Dartmouth, an unprecedented NLRB ruling classifies student athletes as employees has paved the way for basketball teams to unionize. In no world should, this, should a scholarship athlete be considered an employee for playing basketball. Even more ridiculous, the Dartmouth basketball players do not even receive athletic scholarships, only financial aid based on need. Receiving some clothes and shoes to play a sport you love does not make a student athlete an employee. Classifying student athletes as employees is an existential threat to the future of college sports on many campuses. The increased cost of unionization, uh, administrative headaches would threaten to make low funded programs economic and, and, and viable, including many women's sports and small school athletic programs, resulting in fewer teams, fewer scholarships, and fewer opportunities for young people. Uh, I ran across a quote real quick I'm going to leave with you. And I think it kind of states to really what's at risk here. This is from uh, Al Shanker, an early union president. When school children start paying, paying union dues, that's when I'll start representing the interests of school children. This is not about the kids. This is about union dues and the, 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 the potential of making a lot of money uh, from the union. So uh, in that, with that being said, let's, I'm looking forward to, to, to uh, having this conversation and make sure we land on the right side of these, these college, uh, college kids. And with that, I yield to the ranking member for opening statement. Ms. Right. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Owens. And thank you to the witnesses for your testimonies today. As members of this committee, our number one priority should be always the students' well-being. Students' well-being was top of mind three years ago when Congressional Democrats single-handedly passed the American Rescue Plan Act and delivered emergency financial aid to 18 million college students during the height of the pandemic. During the turbulent period, we focused on ensuring that students were set up for success. And I hope that today's hearing does not deviate from that approach. Since its inception, the NCAA has prohibited collegiate athletes from being compensated for their labor. According to the NCAA, athletes can take scholarships up to the full cost of attendance in their current educational programs, but they may not get funds for graduate programs, meal stipends, living accommodations, or variable educational expenditures. This puts college athletes who are entirely dependent on financial aid in an impossible position. Furthermore, the most essential voice in the room should be that of the college athletes. 
because without them, there would be no collegiate sports industry. So hear them, see them, and do what is best for them. As our witness, Mr. Gaston Pierce, notes in his testimony, the route forward after unionization is undetermined, but we do know that athletes deserve a seat at the table. Allowing students to organize unions is an important step toward making college athletics a safer and more equal place for athletes to thrive. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back, and I look forward to a productive discussion. Thank you. Pursuant to rule, Committee Rule 8C, all members who wish to insert written statements in the record may do so, so by submitting them to the committee clerk electronically in Microsoft Word format by 5 p.m., 14 days after the date of this hearing, which is March 26, 2024. Without objection, the hearing record remain open for 14 days to allow such statements and other extraneous materials referenced during the hearing to be submitted for the official hearing record. We'll now turn to the introduction of our distinguished witnesses. Our first witness is Ms. Jill Bodensteiner, uh, Bodensteiner, Bodensteiner, I'm sorry, who's the Vice President and Director of Athletics for St. Joseph University, which is located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Our second witness is Mr. Tyler Sims, who's a shareholder at Littler Mendelssohn in Tampa, Florida, and who before attending law school played NCAA Division I hockey for Providence College and then played professionally for three years. Our third witness is Mr. Mark Gaston Pierce, who's the executive director of the Workers' Rights Institute at Georgetown Law, which is located in Washington, D.C. Our final witness is Mr. Matthew Mitten, who is a professor of law and executive director of the National Sports, Institute, Sports Law Institute at Marquette University Law School, which is located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And we thank all of the witnesses for being here today, and we look forward to your testimony. Pursuant to committee rules, we would ask that you would, would each limit your oral presentation to a five-minute summary of your written statement. And I would also like to re remind the witnesses to be aware of the responsibility uh, to provide accurate information to the subcommittee. And so now I would recognize Ms. Uh, Bodensteiner for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman and Ranking Members. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Jill Bodensteiner, and I serve as the Athletic Director at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. We are a Division I non-football institution and a member of the Atlantic 10 Conference. In my previous career, I practiced employment law for 15 years. Before I talk about unions, I want to acknowledge that the NCA and its members have to continue to reimagine college athletics, including the provision of additional resources to some student athletes. President Baker's recent proposal signals the need and the willingness to do exactly that. I also want to acknowledge that I come from a labor background, and I'm excited about the resurgence of the labor movement in the United States. That being said, I am convinced that the unionization of a handful of college student athletes is not the answer to the significant issues facing college sports. As a threshold matter, I believe that the NLRB regional director's decision in Dartmouth was so broad that NCAA Division II and III student athletes, college students who participate in non-athletic clubs, and actually high school students could be deemed employees. Furthermore, I believe that the unionization of some college athletes could actually be detrimental both to those student athletes and to college athletics as a whole for four primary reasons. First, as noted by the NLRB in the Northwestern case, the core of college athletics is about competition. It's extremely difficult to exist in a competitive environment when teams are playing by different rules. And it is clear that schools would be playing by different rules for the following reasons. <clears throat> First, the NLRA does not apply to public institutions. Second, the NLRB's Bethany College decision in 2020 would allow religiously affiliated institutions of higher education to assert that they are not subject to the jurisdiction of the NLRA. And as has become evident since the 2016 Columbia decision, just because students can unionize does not mean that they will. Second, several legal considerations could lead to confusing results for student athletes and college athletics as a whole. For example, the influence of politics on the NLRB means that the classification of student athletes as employees literally could flip back and forth every four years. 
Also, because each law has its own definition of employee and is adjudicated in different ways, we also have the real possibility that student athletes at some institutions could be deemed employees under the NLRA, not employees under the Fair Labor Standards Act, and may or may not be employees under their state's work comp law. Finally, differing bar different bargaining units, say for example, a men's basketball and a women's basketball bargaining unit could negotiate different benefits which an institution might be unable to provide due to Title IX. Third, there are several issues that could limit the benefits of a union at best, and at worst, may even be detrimental to student athletes. For example, the limited ability to negotiate compensation because such negotiated outcome would have to comply with current NCAA and potentially conference rules. Next, right now, student athletes receive extensive financial aid that is not currently taxed. Shifting to wages would subject them to federal, state, and even local taxes. Also, a transition from the current uh, comprehensive medical treatment and insurance model to a state work comp, I believe, would be detrimental to the student athletes. And finally, the likely inability of, student, of international student athletes to fully compete as employees would be, that, would be detrimental to that group. Fourth, college athletics as it currently exists is not structured with the expectation that student athletes would be employees. The transition to a student athlete workforce could reduce the number of NCA sports sponsored by institutions. NCA rules require institutions to sponsor a minimum number of sports to compete at the Division I level. Many of us, including St. Joe's, exceed that number so that we can offer all of the benefits of college athletics to more student athletes. These additional sports generally do not generate revenue. If Division I schools are required to deploy the resources necessary to support an athlete workforce, for example, at St. Joe's, we have 480 student athletes, there could be many fewer opportunities for student athletes to participate in college athletics at all. In sum, I believe that the limited benefits that unions could potentially gain for a small group of student athletes throughout the United States would not outweigh the considerable negative impact it could have on student athletes in college athletics as a whole. On behalf of my peer institutions and all of our student athletes, I wanna offer my appreciation to the members of this committee for your consideration of these important issues. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now recognize Mr. Sims for five minutes. Chairman Good, Owens, ranking members DeSaulnier and Wilson, and members of the subcommittees. I'm so honored and thankful for the opportunity to speak with you today about a topic that is very important and personal to me. I'm especially humbled to be sitting here with former NLRB Chairman Mark Pierce, who in the Northwestern decision declined to exercise jurisdiction over student athletes which I actually wrote about in law school. I'm grateful to be here to be able to tell you my story. My wife Casey and I are former Division I athletes. She was a field hockey player at Towson University, and I played goalie for the men's ice hockey team at Providence College. Frankly, I would not be sitting here today without that experience as a student athlete. That experience was just as impactful and critical to my personal growth, my success in law school, and in my career as a lawyer, as was the rigorous academic course load I took at Providence. Some of the many lessons I learned as a student athlete include the value of hard work, discipline, teamwork, multitasking, performing under pressure, and taking constructive feedback from coaches, even when I didn't want to hear it. Before going to law school, I tried to follow in my father's footsteps to the NHL. I played professional hockey for three years in the minor leagues for nine different teams, in three different leagues, and was a member of a union called the Professional Hockey Players Association. I appreciated the PHPA as a professional, and I saw value in union representation at the professional sports level. The student-athlete learning experiences over four years are fundamentally different, though, than the experiences I had as a professional athlete. In fact, it is those experiences that helped me become a professional athlete and deal with the pressures and realities of professional sports. I think the educational piece of playing a college sport is often lost in the discussion about whether student athletes should be considered employees. I believe Chairman Pierce and the rest of the unanimous board members got it right in the Northwestern case. These are some of the reasons why I do not believe that student athletes should be classified as employees under the National Labor Relations Act. 
any wages and other compensation paid to student athletes would be taxed. But what about our scholarships that are currently tax free? The tax code exempts athletic scholarships, but does not exempt scholarships when paid in exchange for services like teaching, for example. Will student athletes also have to pay taxes on scholarships? In a typical workplace or in professional sports, employees must perform well or they risk losing their jobs, which is what happened to me a number of times playing professional hockey. Could my tenure with the school be terminated at any time if I wasn't playing well? Would I have time to work through it and try to improve? What if the school did not agree to our demands and the union called us out on strike? An employer is not required to pay employees on strike. Could I still go to class? Would I have to pay out of pocket for my tuition? How would that affect both my academic and athletic career? At Providence, I wanted to become a better hockey player, not only to help my team win, but to try to make it to the NHL. So I voluntarily put in extra time on the ice and in the weight room. Under a collective bargaining agreement, would that be considered overtime? Would the school let me work overtime? What about time spent on academics? While, while we had to maintain a certain GPA, I wanted to excel in school. Would academics be a term and condition of employment and a mandatory subject of bargaining? I also valued talking directly with my coaches. They taught me about life, not just hockey. If I had a problem with my coach taking me out of a game, could I work it out with my coach directly? Or would I have to go to the union shop steward and file a grievance? What if the cost of fielding an NCAA sport became more expensive for our school? Would my sport be cut? What about others? What if I want to transfer? How do I do that under a CBA? Do I have to be bound by a CBA if I don't want it or if I never voted for it? It's not that unions are good or bad. It's the setting here that's the problem. I needed to learn and grow as a student athlete. I didn't need to worry about things like bargaining with the school or any of the other issues I mentioned. I've been thrilled to see the positive changes that student athletes have received over the last 10 years. And I encourage student athletes to continue to speak up for themselves and their teammates. However, I also value the educational purpose behind college athletics. And for all the reasons I mentioned and those in my written testimony, I don't believe that classifying student athletes as employees under the National Labor Relations Act will be a positive change for student athletes. Again, I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss this important issue with you. And I'm happy to respond to any questions. Thank you. We'll now recognize Mr. Pierce for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Good. Oh. Desanye and Wilson and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Um, I was chair of the National Labor Relations Board, as, as you know, and it uh, makes me feel kind of old to hear about somebody in law school reading my decisions. Uh, in 2023, NCAA recorded nearly $1.3 in revenues. Yet since its creation in 1906, the NCAA has barred collegiate athletes from receiving compensation for their labor. Until recently, athletes were even barred from monetizing their names, image, and likeness. Despite the NCAA's record of legal success, trends seem to be increasingly turned towards defining co college athletes in a different way. Last year, legendary Alabama football coach Nick Saban endorsed the college football players unionizing. This is a rapid changing area of the law. And while I'm happy to share my opinion today, I want to clarify that though people still call me chairman, I don't speak for the NLRB or the Biden administration. The term student athlete was coined by the NCAA's president and legal team in 1950 as part of a legal strategy designed to avoid paying a worker's compensation claim to the widow of a football player who died after an injury sustained in a game. The term persists in NCAA and university legal strategies to perpetuate the myth of purity of amateurism. The reality is that most college athletes struggle to, to make ends meet. They never make it to the professional level and are left with little or no benefits 
from those playing, playing days. And many are academically deprived. Graduation rates are lower among student athletes of color than the white, their white counterparts. Just over 55% of black male college athletes graduated within six years, compared with 60% of all black undergraduates. 69% of all college athletes graduate within six years, compared to 76% of all undergraduate students. Racism drives public opposition to paying college athletes. For decades, the NCAA and collegiate sports have ignored a perception in the industry pre prevalent in many communities of color, a plantation dynamic in which predominant white institutions, the NCAA and universities, extract value from black athletes to pad their own pockets. On June 21st, 2021, the Supreme Court decided NCAA versus Alston, holding that the NCAA's rules restrict certain educational related benefits from college athletes, that those restrictions violate federal antitrust laws. Now schools may offer these types of benefits to their athletes, though they are still not allowed to compensate athletes directly. On February 5th, the NLRB regional director held that Dartmouth men's basketball players are employees under the National Labor Relations Act. And one month later, those basketball players overwhelmingly voted to unionize and joined many other student workers at Dartmouth already unionized and represented by the same union. Although the path forward is unclear, the status quo simply cannot persist, and it will not. The NCAA is reading the writing on the wall, so much so that in December of last year, its president, Charlie Baker, sent a letter to Division I members proposing the creation of a new subdivision wh whose schools would be required to provide significantly greater compensation for their athletes than current associations allow. Current conditions are unsustainable and unjust. <coughs> it is worth considering the ideal process through which and uh, to address the challenges facing college athletes. A collective bargaining relationship could be the most effective means of doing so, as opposed to the adversarial approach. Collective bargaining ensures athletes have a seat at the table. As Justice Kavanaugh alluded, this approach has promise in creating more just and workable outcomes. I welcome your question. Thank you. We'll now hear from Mr. Mitt, uh, Professor Mitten for five minutes. <coughs> uh, thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairman and Ranking Members and other SIB Committee members. It is a honor and a pleasure to testify before you today. Uh, for 35 years as a law professor, I've been studying and writing books and articles about a wide variety of college sports legal issues. Since 1906, based on a uniquely American amateur education model, embodying President Theodore Roosevelt's philosophy that intercollegiate sports should be first class, healthful play, a means in life, and organized to permit the largest possible number of students the chance to take part, NCAA educational institutions have provided over five million educational and athletic participation opportunities to female and male students from all socioeconomic backgrounds in a variety of sports. From 1906 to the present, intercollegiate athletes have been full-time students participating in a variety of sports as extracurricular activities at NCAA colleges and universities. They currently have higher graduation rates than their non-athlete student peers. The NCAA's almost 1,100 member nonprofit, private and public colleges and universities are organized into three divisions based on the philosophy and competitiveness of their respective athletic programs. In 2023, NCAA member institutions sponsored more than 20,000 intercollegiate men's and women's teams in 36 championship and emerging sports. Most don't generate sufficient revenues to pay their costs. Student athletes who voluntarily choose to play college sports have a contract with their schools 
establishing both sides' legal rights and obligations. Applicable NCAA, divisional, and athletic conference rules are incorporated into and are terms and conditions of the intercollegiate sports participation contract between a student athlete and their college or university. All NCAA intercollegiate athletes are required to be full-time students in good academic standing and to maintain satisfactory progress towards earning a bachelor's degree. The 2022 NCAA Constitution retains the association's historical amateur educational model of college sports by prohibiting pay for play while permitting student athletes to receive educational and other benefits in accordance with guidelines established by their NCAA division. State legislatures and courts have refused to characterize the contract between either a private or public educational institution as an employment contract for purposes of workers' comp insurance coverage. Federal appellate courts have rejected assertions that college athletes are university employees or that athletic conferences or the NCAA are their joint employers under the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act. In 2015, the National Labor Relations Board rejected a petition to unionize Northwestern University football scholarship players because it would not further stable relations. The board has no jurisdiction over intercollegiate sports at public universities, which must comply with state labor laws and may not allow student athletes to unionize. Since 2015, NCAA rules changes have been beneficial, not de detrimental to intercollegiate athletes. The 2022 NCAA Constitution permits fair market value pay for publicity from the commercialization of college athletes' NIL rights. Student athletes currently have greater rights and protections, including constitutional commitments by the association, divisions, athletic conferences, and member institutions to protect, support, and enhance student athlete physical and mental health and safety, and to conduct their activities without gender discrimination. Student athletes also have voting representatives on the NCAA Board of Governors and highest divisional governing bodies. Recharacterizing college athletes as employees in 2024, 118 years after the NCAA's founding, threatens to destroy the, very, the historically very successful model of intercollegiate sports and raises numerous complex and unprecedented federal labor law issues, as well as potential and actual conflicts with other fe federal laws, such as the Fair Labor Standards Act and Title IX. It could result in less favorable treatment of student athletes, including their being fired for unsatisfactory sports performance, more restrictive limits on their earning capacity or ability to transfer schools. Um, my concern is that uh, permitting college athletes to unionize will significantly increase their cost and a uh, undesirable consequence will be elimination of numerous intercollegiate sports teams, particularly non-revenue generating Olympic and women's teams or their downgrading to club sports. Thank you for considering my testimony and I welcome your questions. Thank you, uh, Professor Mitten. Uh, under committee rule nine, we will now question witnesses under the five minute rule. I will wait to ask my questions and therefore I recognize the chairman of the Higher Education Workforce Development, Development Subcommittee, Mr. Owens from Utah for five minutes. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Uh, Bonesteiner, uh, most of the student athletes will never compete professionally in their sport. In fact, only 1.6% of NCAA football players ever play in the NFL. What impact would employee status have ensuring these college students, uh, athletes, can continue to focus first and foremost on being students and on their academic success? Thank you for your question. Um, I first want to say that I think it's important to understand the diversity within college athletics and a lot of the statements we've heard uh, pertain primarily to football. I'm a non-football institution. Contrary to bringing in, uh, making a profit, we are 80% subsidized by the university in our athletic department. Um, and so this is not a money-making enterprise at most institutions without football, certainly, uh, including St. Joe's. So. Uh, at St. Joe's, our student athletes graduate at a higher rate than our regular students, and our student athletes of color graduate at a higher rate than our non-student athletes of color. I am really proud, as with Dartmouth, and how we do 
uh, put academics first, and there are a myriad of ways in which we do so. So I think one, in response to your, in, in response to your question, uh, one fundamental issue is would a academic matters be subject to bargaining? And so um, some of the academic support offered and um, you know, eligibility rules, those sort of things. What would, you know, what is the, the play between collective bargaining and mandatory subjects of bargaining versus uh, academic matters like uh, study hall and extra tutoring and all those sort of things. Um, but frankly, I think the answer to the question is of what would change has a lot to do with the current engagement of both the institution and the student athlete. At Dartmouth, it is academic first in every sense of the word. Uh, and I think we would try and, and remain for it to be that way at Dartmouth and at St. Joe's, but, but being employees fundamentally changes the nature of that relationship. I think somebody mentioned earlier, every college would have to address this differently. Am I correct? A absolutely. Okay, we yes. all have different academic structures. Okay. Uh, Ms. Sims, like uh, other college students, uh, uh, student athletes must satisfy certain academic standards to, to gain admission to their to the universities and participate in extracurricular activities, including sports. Uh, th uh, there are no academic or educational requirements for professional athletes. If student athletes are deemed to be employees by the NLRB, would university administrators and faculty be obligated to negotiate such academic standards with labor unions? Yeah, I think that's an un, un uh, Chairman, I really appreciate your question. Thank you so much. I, I really think that's an unanswered question at this point. Um, as my colleague stated here, you know, whether academics would be a mandatory subject of bargaining is something that, that we don't really know um, at this point. So um, you know, would student athletes, for example, want to have less class time so they could focus more on sports? Um, we don't know those answers. And, and frankly, it would fundamentally change um, the thought process of a student athlete because they'd be focused more, in my opinion, on compensation and how much money they're going to make as opposed to um, you know, making sure they get to class, um, having class requirements. I remember when I was at Providence, uh, I would get, you know, we would have check-ins, our, our coaches would come to class and make sure that we were there. Um, so would that all change? And, and the answer is we don't know. Okay, very good. Professor Mitten, uh, your testimony provides a historical perspective on college, uh, American college ath athletics. It recounts that college athletes are designed, uh, athletics are designed to be a vital part of the educational system with ath athletes as an integral part of the student body. This is unique to America. Can you discuss the educational and athletic opportunities this system has provided for our young, our young Americans? Yeah, as I mentioned, there's been, you know, I think it's 5.15 million um, student athletes that have had an opportunity to uh, participate in the sport that they love to get either you know debt free or low cost um, college education depending upon the divisional level and there's those educational benefits extend beyond just playing the sport so for example I've been on um, the law school admissions committee at a couple different law schools uh, including my current one at Marquette and I can tell you when I see applications from uh, former intercollegiate athletes, um, that's a very big plus factor for mm -hmm. me because of the, you know, learning, you know, teamwork, cooperation, um, not every day is going to go great. Um, the, the, the discipline, time management skills, I think is absolutely critical on that. So for me, I've seen it, even though I didn't have the good fortune to be an intercollegiate athlete, um, the benefits, educational benefits that extend after the student athlete has started playing their sport. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. We'll now recognize ranking member, or oh, no, now recognize Mr. Courtney from Connecticut for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses for your very thoughtful uh, comments. I mean, I think this is really a helpful exercise to sort of, um, you know, tease out, again, a lot of the, the issues. Um, so, Mr. Pierce, you know, when you were chairman of the NLRB, you were there when the Columbia University decision was handed down that uh, recognized the right of teaching assistants um, to organize and unionize. Um, I've been around in Congress for a little while, and this certainly has echoes um, of the same sort of um, arguments, or the echoes of the arguments against it sound familiar today in terms of just that, you know, these are people who... Uh, you know, are getting all kinds of other benefits in their you know life journey and that um, you know they really don't 
um, belong to be in, in a category recognized by the NLRB. And I, I was wondering if you could just sort of tease out a little bit more about the fact that, um, you know, the, 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 the world didn't come to an end, you know, when, when NLRB recognized a, a right to organize and that, um, you know, universities benefited to them probably more than it cost universities. And that sort of seems very analogous to the situation we're discussing today. You're absolutely right. Thank you for that question. The uh, Columbia decision demonstrated most emphatically that uh, the quest for a degree as a student is distinguished from the obligations and the benefits to the school that, uh, that are gained through the employment of these students as employees. So employees have to do work. In this situation, the work of the college athletes will be playing the sport. Uh, the questions related to whether or not uh, the academics will be imposed upon is not exactly on point given the fact that the athlete's job will be playing the sport and the athlete's a activity relative to his or her degree is being a student. Um, what we learned in Columbia was that the functioning of students as employees worked very well. And what was instructive in that regard was the public sector where students had been employees for decades before the Columbia decision had started and they have functioned very well. In fact, uh, their abilities have been enhanced as a result of the security that they've gained. Great, well thank you for that answer. And you know, one thing that I think is important for everyone to also consider um, is that you know, recognizing the right to unionize doesn't mean that everybody's gonna unionize. I mean, we know that, you know, that only about 10% of the private sector in this country, probably less, is unionized, uh, even though uh, people have the right uh, to unionize. Public support for unions, by the way, is at a near record high. So, um, you know, but that just demonstrates that, you know, that doesn't necessarily translate into automatic um, union, uh, you know, formation that's there. So, um, in the case of Dartmouth, where they don't, they don't get scholarships, you know, the kids, they don't get scholarships. So for them, you know, the issue of, um, you know, whether they're going to get taxed or whatever just was a non-issue. But they had other issues which were, you know, I think very legitimate in terms of the fact that they were paying out-of-pocket um, health costs for injuries which, um, you know, they incurred as, as athletes. And again, it, these, I, I, I represent the University of Connecticut. We have a lot of ACL injuries for um, our basketball players, which are, you know, in some cases, um, permanent disabilities. So th that's not an insignificant concern that the students at, at Dartmouth had. By the way, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to add to the record uh, a letter from uh, two of the athletes explaining why we are unionizing, which I think is a very thoughtful piece. I mean, they're big boys and big girls. They can kind of think through <laughs> these issues about whether a union uh, worked for them. So again, particularly in the area of just, you know, health and safety, um, you know, th that may be enough for people to, to decide they want to union. It may be in other instances it won't. And it's, um, that's the way the NLRB works. It's not automatic. You've got to still go out and hold an election. Isn't that correct? That's, that's absolutely correct. Well, thank you. And, um, you know, the one consensus item was uh, we heard from Mrs. Bonenstein that we need to reimagine co college athletics. Mr. Pierce says, you know, the status quo is not sustainable. I mean, we've got to, to come up with a better plan. I think the, the right to unionize would provide some external pressure to force colleges and universities to think and reimagine um, how we treat uh, student athletes. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. We'll now recognize Mr. Wahlberg from Michigan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the panel for being here. Uh, this is an important subject. Just last week, I, I read the comments of uh, um, great coach Nick Saban um, shortly after his loss to the national champion undefeated University of Michigan Wolverines. I don't know if I've ever mentioned that before. Go blue. Um, but it was interesting as he talked about the reason he had decided to retire. 
And uh, it wasn't because he lost to Michigan. It was because some of his athletes were coming in immediately after that, looking to next season and asking him what was in it for them. Basically, what contracts they would have, what earning capabilities they would have. And Nick Saban, I think, rightly said to himself, this is a new world. It's not for me. This is not what athletics is all about. As an athlete, a wrestler, it prepared me for life, but it wasn't life. It prepared discipline, character qualities, all of the rest. And so now to talk about NIL and unionization and all of the rest, I think unionization is a, a, a responsible thing for their adult lives. But in the learning process, it could be a, a great hindrance. And I think Nick Saban saw much of that. When we think about the impact that, that athletics has on students, uh, the number of international athletes that are now competing for the same spot on, on, on teams sharply increased. Um, College athletics serve many purposes, highlight women's sports, uh, support local communities, um, and an is an important pillar to the Olympics. Um, very important. Uh, the consequences of what we're talking about today are, today are troubling, the impact it could have. Mr. Sims, the NLRB regional director's decision in Dartmouth case has consequences to come, and you've expressed some of them. My district in Michigan is home to Adrian College, Albion College, Spring Arbor University, and I could go on with several others who, who, who compete as private Division III schools with ath athletic programs. And significant, Adrian College, significant hockey program. Uh, if the Dartmouth decision is upheld, what do you believe will happen to other private colleges in Division I, II, III uh, in, with their intercollegiate sports? Thank you for the question. I appreciate it. Um, I, I do believe that um, you know, if student athletes are classified as employees and the Dartmouth decision is upheld, I, I think it could really change the uh, competitive balance in college sports. Um, we're, you know, you're dealing with a, about a third of universities that are private in the, in the NCAA. Um, so you have you know, about two thirds that are public universities. And, there are many states uh, around the country that uh, don't allow public employees to collectively bargain. Um, there's also uh, states like, like yours in Michigan who um, have specifically carved out student athletes as not employees, uh, public employees. So um, I, I think about the, the competitive imbalance that could result from it. When you look at all the sports leagues, um, for example, those are league-wide bargaining units. Um, you know, the, the, the NLRB's history um, in issuing um, decisions re around sports leagues have been about league-wide bargaining units. Um, and it was something that was even mentioned in the Northwestern decision that mm -hmm. a single-team bargaining unit is something that um, would, be, would be difficult to imagine and, and, and it, would, it, would, it would not stabilize uh, labor relations around the country. Oh, thank you. Um, Ms. Badensteiner, um, most universities don't generate a profit from their athletic programs, as you've indicated. In fact, we've seen schools over the past several years drop programs. A few years ago, Michigan State University, of all, of all places, uh, dropped its men's and women's swimming program. Uh, and Lindenwood University in Missouri recently announced it would cut 10 programs. If Dartmouth case is upheld, uh, what would the financial impact be on college athletics programs and their long-term viability for the majority of schools? Thank you for the question. I do believe that the infrastructure required to have, for example, 480 St. Joe's student athletes treated as employees, and depending on the scope of that, we could be talking out, tracking hours, time cards, um, you know, hiring, firing, posting positions, negotiating potentially with 21 different bargaining units. The infrastructure alone to support a student athlete workforce would be incredibly expensive, and I believe schools would have very difficult decisions to make. Thank you, my time has expired, I yield back. We'll now recognize Ms. Bonamici from Oregon for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses. I represent a district in a very labor and worker-friendly state, 
I'm a strong supporter of collective bargaining for fair and just compensation, benefits, and working conditions. I do want to note that my state just a couple of weeks ago passed legislation prohibiting the NCAA athletic conferences or other athletic governing bodies from punishing uh, schools and student athletes for violating the name, image, likeness uh, rules, although they also added athletic reputation. I think these conversations are happening across the country. Uh, college and university athletics, as we know, generate billions of dollars for the NCAA, but most students don't see much beyond scholarships that may or may not cover the cost of their education. And as, as directed by athletic departments, student athletes invest substantial time in practices, workouts, travel, games, some of which come at the expense of, I see you're shaking your head, Mr. Sims, and bringing back memories, right? Uh, may come at the expense of attending classes. Despite this, student athletes are supposed to be considered student athletes or students first, athletes second. Thank you, Mr. Pierce, for giving us a little history about where that came from. Uh, even as the NCAA and the schools they attend continue to profit. Studies in recent years have found that anywhere from 25 to 60 percent of Division I student athletes have experienced food insecurity. Even greater numbers of these students have lived below the federal poverty line or continue to do so. So it is no wonder that some student athletes are choosing to unionize to get the rights and benefits they deserve. And I say choosing because as Mr. Courtney pointed out, this is a choice, there is an election. So Mr. Pierce, the NCAA and its respective divisions have shown that they are not capable of addressing every issue of concern regarding college athletes in a timely manner they're also unable to produce an individualized solution in every case. So what are the advantages of an athlete's union over the NCAA and division committees trying to resolve particular issues? Thank you so much for that question. The ability for students to unionize gives the students a seat at the table in real time. So a union who knows the, uh, the concerns of the particular athletes and the priorities that the athletes have with respect to equities and injustices can bring that forward in a collaborative way with the university so that the best solutions can be uh, hashed out mutually uh, rather than some kind of top-down approach to say, well, we're going to try this, we're going to try that, and it may not necessarily work. The importance is that the students need a sense of better work-life balance. They know how it's imbalanced, and they can address it most effectively. So in other words, this, the student athletes' voices are very important, no doubt. Uh, and we've heard a lot of talk about that. And again, as Mr. Courtney pointed out, that happened at Dartmouth. The students stepped up and made that decision. So how would joining a union or forming a union be one of the most direct and effective ways for students to have their voices heard, Mr. Pierce? Well, the, the, there is an obligation to collectively bargain. Um, the, the, work, the employee status of, uh, of athletes uh, gives them the opportunity to have that seat at the table that I, that I addressed before. Uh, a collective bargaining agreement would have particular provisions that deal with safeguards like safety, um, how, how much it would affect your, your study to have to go through the rigors of, of, a, a, of sports training and so forth, and negotiate whether or not they have to fly around across continents in order to play within the league for their games and then have to come back with jet lag and trying to, to, to study. Those are kind of items that they'd be able to negotiate. No, I, I appreciate that. And, and Mr. Pierce, one final question. Some are suggesting that uh, allowing students to, student athletes uh, to unionize, not requiring, allowing them to make that decision and, and have an election would be the end of college athletics as we know it. Do you agree with that? I do not. Absolutely not. Because we, as, as we, we can see, um, the, all of the professional sports teams have been able to to function and, and, and make certain adjust, adjustments. Uh, each school has its own unique set of circumstance. Each uh, athlete who uh, decides to unionize can only unionize if the factors exist based on the NLRB's assessments. So it's not going to be one size fits all at all. 
Thank you. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We'll now recognize Mr. Allen from Georgia for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased that we're holding a hearing today on this important topic. Uh, you know, I believe the American people uh, deserve choice, and that includes uh, someone who's looking beyond high school. Um, you know, we've talked about higher education quite a bit here in this committee over the last few months. A lot of things going on in college that, uh, and, and then some some folks might want to go directly into the workplace or go get a skill, those kind of things. There are all kinds of options available uh, today beyond high school. Um, you know, when it comes, to, we're, we're talking about athletics here today, but there are lots of other ways, other ways to go to college. Uh, there are you know, academic scholarships, there are uh, Certain corporations give scholarships because uh, people have certain abilities. I played football and all the sports in high school, but uh, my, my great talent was a long snapper, and I probably could have walked on as a long snapper, but, but not as a scholarship player. But I had a trade. I learned how to well in high school, and I used that trade to uh, pretty much work my way through college. And so that was kind of my choice. Uh, so there are all kinds of choices out there. And, it, it, you know, as far as trying to unionize, I don't think you, if you unionize, you got one choice. And everybody makes the same amount of money. <laughs> uh, so I don't, I don't know how you do that uh, because uh, you, you take the NIL. Uh, you, your quarterbacks are making a million, and I don't know if the linemen are not making that kind of money. So, uh, you know, uh, and I worked in a union company, and uh, you know, if you had this level of skill, you made everybody made the same amount of money. And um, but uh, it, it, talking about name, image, and likeness, uh, uh, you know, this is what has captivated uh, this whole conversation. And and now the uh, Biden's National Labor Relations Board has gotten on board and says, hey, this is an opportunity to expand its authority and force student athletes and to employee status and unionization, uh, which really will only serve to restrict student freedom and their ability to choose exactly what's the right course for them. And frankly, the very purpose they're there could lower their educational standards, because as my uh, uh, friend uh, Bert Sowen said, only one percent, one point something percent of these folks go to the next level. So uh, that education then becomes very valuable. Uh, I am in, that's why I'm interested in legislation that would ensure that both football and basketball players in this country are eligible for the draft directly out of high school. We are, uh, you know, the, the athletes coming out of high school today are not the athletes that came out of high school when I was there. And a lot of those folks, uh, are ready. I mean, they're ready to play in the big leagues and uh, ready to go make, uh, you know, the, every to, to really be rewarded for their hard work. Uh, currently, uh, s some athletes are, are playing college sports for financial reasons, as uh, illustrated by uh, Coach Saban. And uh, as, pro, uh, as pro sports collective bargain agreements, though, restrict their entry into the free market. And, uh, and so nullifying these rules would empower athletes to make their own decisions about their Mike. No. The most popular question I'm asked at cocktail parties is why does the NCAA have a one and done rule in basketball and a three year rule? People don't understand those are not NCAA rules. They are collectively bargained. It's great for the owners because they get to see how athletes perform at the college level before they invest money and draft them. Um, those collective bargaining agreements, particularly in the NFL, basketball is getting better with G League and other options. They have collectively bargained football high school student athletes into one choice only, and that is to attend college, whether they have any interest in getting an education or not. 
and uh, the fact that the college athletics is a free minor league for the National Football League. I mean, kudos to the NFL for pulling it off, but um, it's put college athletics in a very, very difficult well, position. I think the, que the question here, and I'm out of time, but the question here is do you go to college to get an education or do you go to college to further your athletic career? I, I think most student athletes go to college to get an education, but there's no choice. You have, if you want to be a pro football player, you have to go to college whether you want the education or not. So I believe those students should have the opportunity to go direct to football and then if they want to go back to college later on, they can do Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Just okay. as baseball and hockey exactly. players do. Thank you. Th thank you. We'll now recognize Mr. Tis Mr. Tocano from California for five minutes. So uh, is it Ms. Bodensteiner? Uh, so you would be open to the idea of separating the idea of collegiate education from public spectacle, the responsibility to provide public spectacle, that uh, the money that accrues from uh, high stakes athletics, what is, we have created this nexus between uh, universities uh, and uh, you know, high stakes uh, athletic competition. Um, uh, in your view, there's not necessarily a nexus or does that need to be one? I think that there is an unfortunate decision that high school football athletes have to make if they want to go to the NFL um, just as many individuals can leave high school and enter a trade and do so freely, uh, I think high school football players are put in a very difficult situation that they have to go to college as their opportunity to get to the NFL. Of course, there are risks that accrue to the, the collegiate athlete uh, who misses out on an education. Um, that, but that's a whole other discussion about whether they should be unionized or not. But could we not draw a distinction between schools like yours, which subsidize all of the athletic programs versus those schools where, uh, that are, where athletics, basketball or, or football is a high revenue uh, maker. I mean, it subsidizes not only athletics, but one could even say it subsidizes many other parts of the university operation. There are significant differences and that's, yes, there are so significant we differences. So we ought to be talking on, on two different planes here. Uh, so Mr. Pierce, uh, you know, um, much of what you have written about, um, I think, applies to the idea that collegiate athletes, many of them uh, minorities, racial minorities, uh, provide a great amount of value. Uh, uh, a value, as you said, is extracted from them, uh, and they don't necessarily benefit from the value extracted. In fact, is it not the case that in many, in many schools, coaches make more money than the university president? That is very true. Yes. Can you give us an idea of what those salaries are? Do you have that off the top of your head? Oh, not off the top of my head, but if I were to say $5 million uh, for a coach's salary, I would not be off base. I think the American people, if they were to look squarely at the amount of revenue they generate for the coach's salary, the amount of revenue they generate for maybe subsidizing the other athletic programs, but not just that, but uh, the dependency of many universities on the athletic program to subsidize many of their other operations, maybe even the research that goes on there, uh, that there seems to, that there's something out of whack there, that the students, the athletes themselves generate this revenue, but what can we say they get in return? Um, can you comment more on this sort of imbalance? Well, the imbalance is substantial. It, uh, athletes are not getting th their returns, and the athletes of color who are playing f football and basketball in the powerhouse schools are, through their services, producing so much revenue for the school that the school is being be benefited in other areas that are not um, profit-making. So. The basketball team is, in many cases, supporting the hockey team or the tennis team or the swimming team. And so a lot of the activities that is being subsidized is subsidized on the backs of it, these it could players. Have, it could have been said that the educational scholars, the scholarships which allow those other athletes to get an education are actually being, uh, it's, it's being won off the backs on the hard work the daily training that uh, the athletes from the high revenue sports provide. That's correct. 
Um, and this whole idea that, that, uh, that a seat at the table um, in real time, the NCAA, the NCAA has rules about, uh, about how many hours an athlete can work during the term time and off term time. Are those rules often not adhered to and violated, do you think? They're substantially not adhered to and, and significantly violated. Uh, testimony uh, by USC players and former players talk about 40 to 60 hours a week of... of so, sorry, I only have 30 minutes left, uh, 30 seconds, but the high stakes nature, the high paid salaries would give incentives to kind of not observe those rules and to not, the NCAA rules, would not collective bargaining give uh, the players the wherewithal and the leverage to have those NCAA rules enforced. That's correct. Um, I, uh, and I would further submit that uh, rather than speculate whether collective bargaining would violate NCAA uh, standards, I would say that collective bargaining has a chance, an opportunity to make sure that those standards are actually adhered to and enforced. That's that, the exact opposite. Oh, that's correct. Um, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We'll now recognize Mr. Grothman from Wisconsin for five minutes. This one go Can we help him? General question for Mr. Mitten. Uh, when we think of college sports, we think, I guess, of Division I football, Division I basketball, because that's what's on TV, and that's what comes to mind. But just looking at one of the uh, non-Division I colleges in my district, they, they have baseball, basketball, football, cross-country swimming, wrestling, track, tennis, volleyball, gymnastics, soccer, and golf. Um, you at Marquette have a big time basketball program, division one, super stuff. But how many other sports do they play at Marquette other than just division one basketball? I think there's roughly a, r roughly a dozen other sports besides uh, men's and women's basketball. Okay, and, you, and Marquette is big deal on division one basketball. You've got other other colleges like Concordia or uh, Wisconsin at Oshkosh in my district who have no, as far as I know, income-producing sports. Percentage-wise, and if you can't take a stab at this, someone else can, what percent of athletes around the country are playing in, in income-producing sports? Well, we start with there, there's roughly, I think it's 525,000 NCAA athletes across all three divisions. The only sports that typically generate revenues would be some Division I FBS teams. That would be the ones, uh, the autonomy conferences, Big Ten, SEC. Right, probably not Central Michigan. Right? No, that's, that's certainly true. Um, then you have Division I men's basketball teams. Um, you don't of that number, I think it's probably less than 20,000. If you add up the number of Division I basketball, uh, men's and women's Certainly athletes, well under 5%, right? Uh, I would yes. Think. Yeah. Um, therefore, if we said uh, student athletes were considered employees, the reason the university world fights that is because that would make well, both income but and non-income producing sports more expensive to operate, right? Yes. And if, say, at Marquette, the cost of operating, I don't know what all the sports you have there, uh, but, but these other sports, uh, if, if you drive up the cost there and drive up the cost for your Division One basketball program, what's the way you deal with increased cost? What are universities obviously going to do? Well, then you're going to look to reduce costs, and I think what's likely to happen is the sports. We don't want to see a model, for example, be just the sports that you're going to get rid of sports, aren't you? Yes. You're going to get rid of a lot, and, and that's even at Marquette where you got the big basketball team at Wisconsin at Oshkosh at Concordia, to name two other universities in my district, who are who are losing money off the top. Uh, can you guess wildly, I, just, I suppose it's unfair to do this to you, guess wildly what sports would disappear 
what athletes are going to lose the chance to play in sports because either they are classified as employees or even worse, become unionized? Well, I'd say largely Olympic sport athletes. Um, some women's sports, of course, Title IX requires that there be, um, you know, gender equity in terms of uh, number of sports participation opportunities, equal treatment benefit. But I think a number of sports that are now intercollegiate will be downgraded to club sports. Tennis, golf, wrestling, swimming, that sort of thing will be club, become club sports, right? I think that's what's most likely to happen. Right. So the big impact of this on people is a lot of athletes in what we'd call non-income producing sports. I hate to use the phrase minor sports, but not, they, they just lose that opportunity, right? I, I think that's what's most likely. Yeah. One other comment, I want one of you guys to comment on it. It is my belief right now in smaller universities, NAIA or Division Three or whatever, um, that sometimes the universities use these sports, I know they do, and small universities to bring in more tuition revenue. In other words, in a way they're taking advantage of the kids because they're saying you're gonna have this great experience here, but they're, they're feeding off of their desire to continue their high school career, and uh, as the result, maybe they don't wind up with something of value because they've been used just to get more tuition, get more butts in the seats. Could, could one of you guys comment on that? I'll take a stab at that. Um, I think, first of all, you're right to in your questioning. Um, when you think about our rowers, our tennis athletes, they're benefiting ex substantially from their uh, opportunity to participate as athletes. And um, I think that's unquestioned. The amount of enrollment and money being brought in by athletes is changing significantly as you look at discount rates on the rise and topping, putting athletics aid on top of that. I think gone are the days at many schools where they're a revenue or an enrollment driver. Thank you. We will now recognize uh, Ms. Adams from North Carolina for five minutes. Apologies, Ms. Manning from North Carolina. For Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses today. Um, Mr. Pierce, let me start with you. Uh, I think it's clear that we have a differing opinions on this committee, and there are some who believe that the NLRB got it right in the Northwestern case when it comes to the question of college students unionizing, and that the current Dartmouth case is heading in the wrong direction. There are others who believe the opposite. So could you talk to us a little bit about what has changed since the Northwestern case was decided in 2015? Thank you so much for that question. I've been waiting for that, this opportunity. <laughs> um, yes, I was chair when, when Northwestern was decided. Um, the, the phrase Northwest, uh, the board got it right with North, Northwestern is not exactly accurate because the, the board never addressed the question of whether or not these football players in Northwestern were in fact employees. What they did was decide the case based on jurisdiction. The uniqueness of that circumstance was that Northwestern, a Big Ten school, was the only private school within a sea of public sector schools in, the, in, in that division. So it's about having a atmosphere where you can have reasonable, cooperative, and s sensible collective bargaining to exist. To insert a collective bargaining in that atmosphere where the board, and this was prior to the joint employer decisions, and even prior to the Columbia decision where students were recognized as employees, was not ready to be able to insert themselves into a situation where it may be chaotic given the dynamics of a private sector school within this, the sea of, of public sector schools. Things have changed substantially since, since that time. Those decisions that I just mentioned have been decided. The Supreme Court has spoken 
relative to the amount of control that the NCAA has over the universities as well as the students. So a question of a joint employer relationship is very real. And with the Supreme Court saying that the impositions that are being made by the NCAA creates antitrust violations, it has caused a clearer uh, view of the relationship that student athletes have to their universities vis-a-vis -vis the employer-employee relationship. So that, de that decision made in a different context has opened up the opportunity for the courts to claim jurisdiction in this particular case. I want to move to the issue of injuries because we know that college athletes are inherently at risk of injury through their participation in sports in college. The CDC has estimated that over 200, 210,000 injuries occur every year uh, with student athletes, with sports like football, gymnastics, soccer, wrestling having the highest injury rates. And my concern is protecting the health and the safety of these students. So can you talk to us about what college athletes could accomplish collectively in a bargaining agreement, not only to help them when they are injured, but to help them uh, if these injuries prohibit them from participating in athletics in the future? You look to, you look to football and basketball contracts in the professional level where injuries are a significant factor in, in that sport. There are provisions in those collective bargaining, uh, bargaining agreements that protect athletes so that they don't lose their ability to continue with their life in, the, in a decent way. Uh, remember, at the outset of the NCAA's determination that students were student athletes, it was about denying a workers' compensation claim to, to, to a widow. There, um, there have been cases that were litigated for years relative to uh, college athletes trying to get compensation for the injury that they sustained while servicing that school. Collective bargaining would provide that kind of security uh, and it would m be mutually beneficial to both the university and the athletes Thank you. in the process. Thank you. My time is about to expire, but I'm going to get back to you with a question in writing about how collective bargaining could prevent students, particularly female athletes, from issues involving sexual abuse and rape. We've seen it from not just from coaches, but from uh, university doctors. There have been some pretty horrific cases. So I will get back to you with a question in writing. Thank you, and Thank I yield you. back. Uh, I've, I've been a little generous because I started accidentally going over with one of the, this side, and we've done it twice on each side. Please, members, remind you to keep your remarks and the question time to the five minutes because we have several members to still go with their questions. We'll now recognize Mr. Burleson from Missouri for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a strange world. I don't know how we got to this point where we're considering unionizing college athletes. Um, Mrs. Uh, th there's obviously a lot of, of, of uh, it creates a lot of problems. Um, Mrs. Bowden Steiner, is that right? Uh, it is likely that the terms of a collective bargaining agreement between a school and a union representing students, student athletes would be inconsistent with the NCAA rules. For example, players could bargain for higher stipends or fewer classes to remain eligible to participate in collegiate sports. The university would be put in a bind of whether to bargain over subjects that could result in exclusion <coughs> from the NCAA competition. What do you think that the schools should do in such a situation? Uh, I think for some subjects of bargaining, absolutely. They could be in conflict. Let's say the uh, topic is Sundays off um, and your conference has, or the NCAA tournament uh, has Sunday games. So I think there could be situations um, where there may have to be a collective decision made between the employees and the employer to say, uh, we can do that, but we wouldn't be able to participate and let's come to some compromise. I think there would be many conflicts, not all. Some things would be, you know, maybe 
uh, you know, more more gloves as my softball pitcher who I brought with me today. Um, provision of equipment and those sort of things would not, but certainly many topics would be also the subject of conference and NCA rules. Um, I also understand that most of the programs and most universities don't generate profits for their athletic programs, um, which is which is in keeping with what it was intended to be at the you know from the beginning, that it's it's about academic performance, academic achievement, athletic achievement, not necessarily selling ads and uh, selling tickets. So, can you discuss how the universities how this might financially impact universities? Yeah, I mean, none of our 21 sports generates a profit. Um, a few generate revenue. We don't sell tickets to anything other than two sports. Um, and so, as, as I mentioned earlier, I think just the costs of having a student athlete workforce, we currently have 480 student athletes at St. Joe's. Um, and just the infrastructure of, uh, you know, the human resources, the bargaining personnel to manage uh, potentially 21 bargaining units and 480 employees would be extensive uh, costs that, that uh, you know, I think decision number one would be, okay, if there are wages now involved, again, at institutions like mine, um, what does that do to the financial aid? Uh, I think that's where the money would have to come from. And right. so I worry that the access to collegiate athlete, or to college would be uh, decreased at some institutions. And the vast majority of universities that participate in you know, collegiate sports are not private universities. These are public institutions or, or parochial religiously affiliated institutions. As I understand it, they would not be covered. Does that create a competitive disadvantage? That's the difference with Columbia and teaching assistants is they're not competing. Uh, and then when you look at the pros, it's one giant bargaining, you know, it's one group of players. So yes, just take the Atlantic 10 conference. There are 15 members, four publics and several religiously affiliated. So that that's who we're competing against. And so when you try and compete for, you know, coaches and athletic trainers and student athletes, some who would be intrigued by the union, some who wouldn't want a piece of it, the competition is what really makes this different. And the fact that inherently only a portion of the Atlantic 10 could be unionized makes it very difficult. Thank you, Mrs. Bodensteiner. Um, Professor Mitten, um, you know, in, in professional sports, baseball, you know, MLB, the NBA, these athletes are judged by their performance on the field and they can be cut for poor for performance. In contrast, many student athletes, including those who receive scholarships, cannot lose their scholarships or be kicked out of school if they do not play well. As employees, would this change the dynamic? Would student athletes be subject to the same job performance standards as professional athletes? Well, I think it's very likely that they could. You're exactly right in that, you know, scholarships can be awarded multi-years, four or five years at the Division I level, and you cannot take, a coach cannot take away someone's scholarship. And then I quickly have just a little bit of time, and I want to get this question, because I think it's important to our country, and that is, what is the impact that this is going to have on our Olympic teams? You know, many of the athletes in our, on our Olympic Games who are not paid, they're amateur athletes, many of them are college athletes. How would this impact um, America's ability to, to uh, have unpaid athletes. Gentlemen, as time has expired, you can re submit a written answer to that question or use your time when the next if someone calls on you. We'll recognize now Ms. Adams from North Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, and, and thank you to the witnesses for uh, testifying uh, today before the committee. Uh, I do understand uh, what it's like to uh, work without being classified as an employee, as I recall pursuing my PhD, I was uh, a full-time uh, teacher of, of the class that I, that I had, and I, I, I was classified as a teaching assistant, but I did the work of a professor, and I probably didn't get the pay of a professor, uh, but um, I'm uh, certainly happy to see that college athlet athletics attempts to, to follow in the footsteps at the National Labor Relations Board of Columbia University's decision. But Mr. Pierce, let me ask you, um, uh, there's, a, there's a bipartisan interest in, in reforming collegiate sports and, and protecting student athletes, uh, preventing student athletes from being classified as employees. 
uh, would seem to me to be counterproductive towards such reforms. So the NCAA is technically a, a billion dollar industry if you look at the revenue levels year after year. So what would be the rationale uh, uh, or significance in banning these athletes from collegiate, um, collective bargaining or even, or even organizing if they technically meet the standard of what is considered an employee? Well, the only advantage I can see is that it keeps the money in the pockets of those who are gaining the, the substantial revenues. As you stated, the uh, NCAA is a multi-billion dollar organization. These schools profit significantly through their partnership with, with the NCAA. The whole question of athletes being able to unionize provides an opportunity for the athletes to get some of that revenue that they have earned through their labor. Um, we're talking about sports being a job here. And it, it's a job because of the benefit that it provides these institutions as well as the NCAA and the, the ability to be able to reap those benefits equally or at least significantly by an athlete is necessary. Otherwise, we have slavery. Okay, thank, thank you for that. You know, I have four H's that I work on primarily here, um, hunger, higher education, housing, health care. Uh, so I do focus on, on hunger, and I was a little bit dismayed to see that uh, a 2019 survey revealed that 24% of Division I college uh, athletes experienced food insecurity in uh, the previous month. So, Mr. Pierce, would you explain how unionization of college uh, athletes can help uh, address widespread hunger faced by, by the athletes? Well, athletes would be able to negotiate their terms and conditions of employment. Uh, the, the revenues that are denied them would be able to be negotiated so that they could sustain themselves through the resources that the school would be able to, to provide. It would also give them the security that they can continue to ha have the protections necessary if they have injuries and the like and cannot play. Okay, let me, let me uh, move on quickly. The, the NCAA has internal regulations which seek to protect athletes, such as the association's cap on weekly hours toward athletic activities, which according to NCAA surveys is often violated. Now, won't a union help uh, uh, enforce NCAA regulations which seek to protect athletes, and wouldn't it further cause uh, of uh, wouldn't it further the cause uh, of creating a competitive league? No, oh, no question. Just like in any other industrial contract, if the employer tries to impose more working conditions than the contract provides, a grievance can be filed and that would have to be resolved through a grievance arbitration process. Okay, great. Well, thank you. I have uh, 20 seconds left. I'm going to yield back, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now recognize Mr. Bean from Florida for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and good morning, committee and witnesses. Welcome. We're glad to have you here. And it is a scary picture we're, uh, we're, we're looking at, I guess. The road we're going down is uh, it's just a weird place to be. I was just talking to Representative Moran of where we are. Uh, Mr. Boden, uh, Madam Boden, Bodensteiner, you've said it's a dark road and there are some very scary implications should all student athletes be employees. What are some of those at the top of your list to make it scary? I think, I think maybe even beyond the scariness is just I'm not sure it solves the problems. And I acknowledged at the beginning we have issues to resolve, but I'm not sure a handful of unions representing one sport at one school or 10 schools around the entire country gets to those issues in an impactful way. 
And when you do a cost benefit analysis and you do look at the, I think student athletes, you know, there's no money to give at St. Joe's, right? And so now they're being taxed instead of their financial aid. Now they're perhaps going through work comp instead of what I think is one of the most misperceived issues in college athletics is the very rich treatment and insurance benefits that we provide. Um, happy to go into those in more detail, but I think um, having student athletes file a work comp claim and the university could deny and then they go get a go to a work comp judge like I, I don't see that helping the athletes at St. Joe's so I and, think they're and it detracts from the purpose of college which is preparing young people for the world that, of which they are about to embark so your, your written testimony is very uh, it, it's a lot so thank you so much Professor Mitten uh, employees uh, can lose their job employees if student at, if student athletes are employees uh, let alone whether they're a professional uh, play on the field, but they could get fired for for just not living up to expectations. Is that true? I mean, we could fire a student employee. They could get fired for not playing well? Yeah, I wouldn't want to have been one of Rick Pitino's basketball players about a month or so ago when he went off on his rant. Now, there could be some protections in the collective bargaining agreement which would provide for a grievance uh, being filed. Um, but th that's a rather cumbersome procedure, of course. Gotcha. And I guess it would just depend on what the contract says. That's correct. I could play mediocre and still make sure that I am an employee, I guess. Uh, let's go to Mr. Sims. Mr. Sims, and you've got a unique perspective because you played in uh, college, you played professionally, but uh, is it true? I mean, I'm just thinking, is it true that uh, – Schools are making their own decisions, but it's really not fair if one school has professional paid athletes and another school doesn't. I mean, wouldn't we have to solve this at a conference or a overall country level to make sure it's a, it's a fair playing field for all student athletes? Thank you for the question. And I think that's what I mentioned earlier in one of my answers is it's the competitive imbalance uh, is one of the things that I really I think about. I think about the potential for increased cost to the, to the school that is engaged in collective bargaining. But I don't think it stops there. I mean, you think about the Fair Labor Standards Act, for example. If student athletes are employees under the National Labor Relations Act, why aren't they employees under <coughs> other federal statutes or state statutes? And so what, what increased costs would that have on a university? Um, would they have to be paid minimum wage? Do we have to track the hours to make sure they're not getting overtime or if they are working overtime, like I probably did at Providence, trying to work on my game uh, voluntarily a lot of times. But um, you know, would that would that be additional compensation going out the door um, at those specific universities? So um, it's not only could the competitive imbalance, but it's the other ramifications that come with this decision. Yeah, as uh, and uh, just from what you're saying too, uh, how it would change if this were in place when you were playing. Can you comment on how? you think it would have affected you when you were playing? I, I was a cheerleader uh, back in the day, and I can't imagine if I didn't stick that pyramid, uh, then I could be fired if, uh, if I was an employee. But tell us about yours in just the brief moment that we have left. Well, thanks for the question. And I, I think it would have significantly impacted my experience um, because I would have been worried about things like bargaining. Is the contract um, that usually lasts between two and four years um, is, was that good for me when it was put in place? Does that continue to be good for student athletes going forward? Um, did the NCAA change any rules? Or the Hockey East, for example, change any rules in the off season that now may violate that contract? Um, so there's, there's a lot of different things that I think about. Um, and worrying about those issues, like bargaining, or if we're going to go out on strike if we don't come to an agreement, that's something I wasn't really interested in worrying about when I was 10 four. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I think we all just learned why Mr. Bean is so passionate and spirited about everything <laughs> here just a moment ago. Uh, thank you. Uh, we will now recognize my good friend from Virginia, Mr. Scott, for five minutes. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Pierce, um, you indicated the factors the NLRB will consider when deciding whether or not a team can un unionize. What factors would you consider, would they consider? Well, <clears throat> thank you for that question. And how are you doing, Mr. Scott? It's good to see you again. <laughs> Um, the fact is, the important fact is to consider is the degree of control that the university has over the students uh, with respect to uh, their responsibilities and their obligations in 
the, in uh, training and performing the sport and how it affects their life, um, their student life um, throughout. Uh, there's been testimony where, where students have to work 40 to 60 hours. They have to comply with particular regulations. They have to get approval to even get haircuts. Um, some students have been uh, required to get scan, scanned and uh, uh, they hire a Gestapo of students to follow them around to make sure that they're going to class. Those kind of elements of control are key elements in determining whether or not the relationship is an employer relationship. The other factor is the compensation that they receive. They receive scholarships as a result of being able to play. They, they, um, the Dartmouth students received uh, early admissions after being, being recruited and, and, and got, got uh, gear paraphernalia being flown all over the country, as well as sports tickets, all of these things that have value. Thank you. Thank you. And what are the potential bargaining units? Is it just the team? Could it be all student athletes at a school or the whole conference? What would the bargaining unit be? Well, the bargaining unit right, would be only the team. It's only the team that, would, that has petitioned to be uh, unionized in, in, in the uh, Dartmouth circumstance. Um, any petitions that get filed by different teams will have to be weighed by the standards that the NLRB uses and determines who constitutes a, an employee and whether or not that group of uh, uh, employees constitute a bargaining unit for, for collective bargaining. The only affected uh, students in this scenario are the 13 students that voted to unionize in okay. this situation. Um, Dartmouth is an interesting case because they don't have um, uh, athletic scholarships. They only have need-based scholarships. Does it make a difference whether or not your scholarship is based on your commitment to play sports? It, it doesn't, it didn't make a difference in the Dartmouth situation because the compensation, uh, the, co uh, the compensation was not determined based on the athletic scholarships. It was based on what I had described before. These students were recru recruited, got early admission. They get all of this paraphernalia, their, their equipment. They are, are sent all over and paid for their lodging and so forth. Those are the kind of criteria in making determinations, in this case, of the compensation received. Mr. Sims, did I understand that if you get an uh, athletic scholarship, you can't be cut from the team? So the, the NCAA <clears throat> recently passed um, rules that, that are in place now, not just at the uh, Power Five conference level, the FBS Autonomy Conference, but uh, across all Division I schools, that if you receive a four-year scholarship going into school, you can't, that scholarship can't be revoked for athletic purposes. Uh, before that, it was a one-year renewable scholarship. Can you be um, cut from the team? I, I, I didn't have anybody that was cut from a team when I played. Um, I don't know anybody that, that was for athletic performance reasons. There were people that left uh, because the, you know, uh, they weren't getting the playing time they hoped for, so maybe they left or, or transferred, but um, I didn't have anybody that was cut from the team. Okay. Um, Mr. Pierce, how is playing sports as a requirement to achieve your financial aid package different from working, say, in the library as a condition of being able to afford college? There's not much difference because there is a quid pro quo. If you want the scholarship uh, through the financial aid package, um, uh, you, have to, you have to do the performance. You fail to do the performance then it would, it would jeopardize uh, your, your financial aid. So there is, there, is, there is a distinct similarity. Now, I'd like to also say that if a, a athlete does not perform... Gentlemen's time okay, has expired. I uh, will now recognize uh, Ms. McBath from Georgia for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairs Good and Owens, and ranking members to Sonia and Wilson of the Help and Higher Education Subcommittee for hosting today's timely discussion. Mr. Pierce, if there's anything else that you'd like to go ahead and complete, please fill. Oh, I was just going to say that it, the, the difference between 
being a student and having a job playing sports in the school is that if you don't perform in the sports, you do get cut, you do get benched. You, if you, the USC uh, uh, former employees testified, former students testified to having had their seen players' lockers get cleaned out because the player left practice early. Um, sure, they were still students, but the job of playing the sports was gone. Thank you for that. Um, this is a really complicated situation, and I'm glad to see that we're here today to begin to discuss this in earnest uh, at the committee level. Student athletes must be treated with dignity and respect, and I think that's what we're here to all talk about today. And they need to be fairly compensated for their efforts while we also ensure that schools, both large and small, can continue to provide the high quality educational and athletic opportunities for students that we have come to expect of them. I think we can all agree that no student in this country should be in a situation where they attend class or practice while not knowing where their next nutritious meal is going to come from or whether they're going to be able to find some place to sleep at night. While this is not the reality for most of our collegiate athletes, it happens to too many of them, and we need to do everything that we can to ensure that all students' needs are being met, especially while they are under the increased pressure and responsibility of being on a collegiate sports team. Students are rightfully concerned about their futures and are looking to their leaders for solutions, not for politics. Now is not the time to scare our students with highly unlikely worst-case scenarios and bad faith exaggerations of the impacts that this recent NLRB decision will have on collegiate sports and even high school sports as claimed by some. We must remember that this applies to just one team at just one private university in a very specific situation. A one-size-fits-all solution doesn't work here, as exemplified by the complexity and the uniqueness of this topic. And I look forward to continuing this conversation with my colleagues on this committee and our universities in Georgia, which I represent, to ensure that any action that we take is going to always put the education of our students first. And I yield back the balance of my time. <clears throat> Thank you. We will now recognize Ms. Hayes for five minutes. Thank you. And thank you to our witnesses for being here today. I'm from Connecticut, and for a long time we didn't have a professional sports team. Now we have the WNBA Connecticut Sun. So college basketball is our sport. Um, and although the NR, NR, NLRB does not cover state schools, I know the benefit of UConn basketball for the state of Connecticut and our economy. And it's worth noting that for years, the two highest paid state employees in Connecticut are the men and women's basketball coaches respectively. So college athletics has become a multi-billion dollar industry. This past fiscal year, the National Collegiate Sports Association or NCAA bought in 1.3 billion in revenue. In fiscal year 2022, the most prominent athletic conferences of the NCAA reported more than $3.3 billion in revenue thanks to the hard work of their collegiate athletes. Not only are these athletes not fairly compensated for the value they provide or skills they possess, but their basic needs are often not being met. A 2019 Hope Center for College Community and Justice survey found that almost 24% of Division I athletes experienced food insecurity in the month before the reporting period. Further, a 2022 study published by the National Institutes of Health found food insecurity more prevalent among college athletes compared to the general university population. Ms. Bodensteiner, do college athletes do college athletic scholarships at St. Joseph University's include, University include a meal stipend? And additionally, are the athletes on partial or no scholarships provided with food assistance? 
Thank you for your question. The amount of scholarship uh, depends on how much uh, athletic aid the coaches have and how much they can give. So some are on full room and board, some are not. Uh, but when they're participating in athletics, meals incident incidental to that participation are covered by the university. Last month, thank you, last month I in introduced the Closing the College Hunger Gap, legislation that would direct the U.S. Secretary of Education to notify college students of their eligibility for SNAP based on information reported through the, through the FAFSA form. Ms. Bodensteiner, do you believe that legislative efforts could help to make sure that college students are receiving meals while they are on the university campus? I think all students need to and deserve to have meals when they're on campus. I've been, you know, horrified at the concept of reducing or doing away with Pell Grants um, that's been spoken about. And athletes can receive Pell Grants, and many do, although at our institution it's less than 10 percent who are Pell Grant eligible. But I'm in favor of any legislation that helps uh, give college students in general access to food. Wow, I didn't expect for you to be my favorite witness today, but thank you for that. <laughs> because I too agree with those things wholeheartedly. All students, hungry kids don't learn. And for a student to be expected to play sports and not have food uh, just exacerbates that issue. In 2015, athletes in football, baseball, men's basketball, and women's basketball in, D in Division One sports reportedly spent about 40 hours a week on athletic activities in addition to the hours spent on academics. Dartmouth basketball players cited their struggle to pay bills as one reason they decided they behind their decision to unionize. Mr. Sims, in your opening, you raised questions about tax status, overtime, and what the definition of an employee is. Aren't all these things um, issues that could be negotiated at the bargaining table and agreed to by both sides, the students and the employers or the universities? Thank you so much for your question. Yeah, those, those issues certainly would be issues that would be collectively bargained. The question is whether uh, the university or the union on the other side would agree. And that's, that's a lot of the uncertainty that, that I spoke about um, in my opening statement was about the uncertainty in collective bargaining and how would that how that would play out. But is again, isn't that the point of collective bargaining to bring those questions to the table and get both sides to come to a compromise? I mean, every time a union goes to the table, there's uncertainty about what's going to happen on both sides. That actually is the basic premise behind collective bargaining. Correct. That is the premise behind it. But it's it, it, the collective bargaining only requires you to bargain in good faith. It doesn't require you to agree to the other side's proposals. So the, again, the question is the uncertainty of whether that would actually benefit the student athletes or not benefit the student athletes. And that's really part of where my concern lies. But if it doesn't benefit, the, the athletes have the opportunity to walk away. My time has expired. Thank you all for your, uh, your testimony today. I yield back. Thank you. We'll now recognize Chairman Fox for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Bodensteiner, an NLRB regional director recently found that the men's basketball players at Dartmouth College are employees. The student athletes subsequently voted to join a union. Can you discuss what impact this decision could have on competition in college athletics? Thank you for the question. Um, we'll start with the, the decision itself, which I thought was um, interesting in terms of the fact that Dartmouth student athletes receive no athletics aid. Their financial aid is purely need based. Um, so, this is a very unusual, I think, application. Uh, you know, it, it's also ironic in that the exact factors that are deemed to be control uh, are also, you know, how student athletes travel, where they stay on the road, are also to protect them. If we sent them out in their own cars and had them find their own Airbnb, we'd be hearing it in a, in a different direction. So uh, I thought those were very interesting application of the facts. But as I've, as I've mentioned here before, uh, I am not uh, anti-union at all. I just am worried about the fact that there would only be a handful of unions in a competitive environment um, that would create even my own conference, the Atlantic 10, where only a few of the schools would be subject to unionization. Uh, would make it very difficult, as Chairman Gaston Pierce recognized in Northwestern, 
to compete on a level playing field, you know, recruiting athletes, recruiting coaches, recruiting athletic trainers, when one is operating under a student athlete workforce and the others are not, I think would be incredibly difficult. Thank you very much. Professor Mitten, collegiate sports have undergone transformational change in recent years. Student athletes may monetize their name, image, and likeness and more freely transfer schools without losing eligibility. Given these significant changes, do requirements still exist to maintain the educational primacy of intercollegiate sports? Uh, yes, very much so, um, Chairwoman Fox. If you look at the 2022 NCAA Constitution, student athletes are much better off than they were in 2015. In fact, I would say there's no better time in the history of the NCAA going all the way back to 1906 student athletes have it very well. I mean, there's um, scholarship protections at the Division I um, level. They can get multi-year scholarships, um, full cost of attendance scholarships, and individual schools, if they want, can provide academic bonuses. Um, above that, just simply for meeting grades, you can get up to almost uh, $6,000 if a school chooses to do it, and then certainly NIL rights. Um, there are some athletes that are getting six and seven figure deals. Well, I think it's always been significant that we do say student athletes. Um, Mr. Sims, in your written testimony, you note that you do not believe it, it, you believe it is not in student athletes' best interest to be classified as employees under the National Labor Relations Act. Can you discuss why you believe that and explain some of the potential consequences of unionization on student athletes? Thank you for the question, Chairman. Um, as I spoke about earlier in my, my opening testimony, I have many concerns about unionization and whether it would result in positive outcomes or not. Um, the first issue being compensation and, and taxes. Um, for, right now, the IRS exempts, currently exempts athletic scholarships. Um, you know, but they don't, the IRS does not exempt scholarships that are based on uh, providing services like teaching, for example. So uh, would that exemption status change and would, you know, student athletes have to pay uh, significant tax bills um, at the end of the year on their, um, on their athletic scholarships? Um, you know, the uncertainty of, of scheduling and overtime, um, would there be a provision in the collective bargaining agreement that would not allow me to voluntarily continue to work on my craft um, or go to, go to uh, tutoring or extra classes? Um, so those are some of the examples that I, that I gave and have in my written testimony. Thank you all very much for being here. Uh, this is a big topic uh, these days, and I think you've shed a lot of light on the issue for us and given us information that's useful, very useful to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Fox. We'll now recognize Ms. Wild from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excuse my froggy voice. Um, Mr. Pierce, um, thank you so much for your testimony and your written materials, they were helpful. Um, I've heard a lot of sky is falling rhetoric uh, this morning regarding what will happen because of the Dartmouth case, and I'd like your help in contextualizing that case. Am I correct that the Dartmouth case only affects their men's basketball team, not their women's team or their volleyball teams or other teams at Dartmouth? That's correct. Thank you. And it doesn't automatically affect other schools. Am I right about that? Um, no. Or Will it, it, will it only affect other schools if athletes pursue employment recognition through the law and insist that they're similarly situated? That's correct. Okay. So the other th concern I have is about smaller colleges and universities um, that have fewer resources um, without huge endowments and so forth. I'm concerned about the potential impact of a universal student athlete employee classification and whether it would affect the ability of these smaller schools to support their athletic programs. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, my thought is that the university as an employer has to make decisions as to what they can afford and what, the, what they can't. 
can't. They do it all the time. They subsidize things that they need. Um, they make a cost-benefit analysis as to whether or not that which they subsidize brings value to the school and, and ha has, has it continue. The Dartmouth students in the cafeteria are unionized. That cafeteria has run at a deficit forever. They were able to negotiate a collective bargaining agreement where their pay was three times that of the New Hampshire minimum wage because the university saw the value in providing this benefit for these students. Likewise, this will be the case in other circumstances with other universities on a case-by-case -case basis because the value that they see translates to goodwill, to increased enrollment, to in alumni co uh, um, contributions, and the like. That is the value that is brought by the services that have been, been provided. Whether or not a institution runs at a loss or a profit does not have anything to do with whether or not these are employees. Amazon had billions of dollars lost last year. Their employees weren't converted to some other status. They were still employees. Um, I also wanted to discuss with you the um, fact that private institutions like Northwestern are governed by the NLRA and public institutions are generally governed by state law. Um, how does that affect the students and their ability to organize? Well, th that is a question that still remains. The general counsel ha has a theory. She says that with the, the, uh, the NCAA, which is a partner with these universities, so much so that it is a, a joint employer with the universities and should be at the bargaining table, is a private entity that, that the NLRB has jurisdiction over. So the well, partnership between the NCAA and even a public sector university under certain theories of the case law could bring that public sector institution under the jurisdiction of the National Labor Relations Board. That's something that the board itself has not weighed in on, but that could be asserted. Okay, great. And since so I, I find myself with the enviable po position of having a few seconds left, um, so much of this conversation is centered around um, men's teams. Um, what is being done by the NLRB to consider the protection of academic and athletic opportunities for women's student athletes? Well, if w women's teams are uh, in a position to file a petition to be unionized and they have meet the employee criteria that has been established in cases like the, the Dartmouth case, they can well be found to be employees and can unionize. Thank you so much. I yield. Thank you. We'll now recognize Mr. Thompson from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Well, Chairman, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our witnesses for being here today. Uh, just in my time since arriving in Congress, the landscape of college athletics really has shifted significantly. And we all know the system is at an inflection point as we deal with the ramifications of name, image, likeness, or, or NIL. And while NIL is not the focus of the discussion here today, and is largely not within the jurisdiction of this committee. It is absolutely critical that Congress come together and provide a clear set of rules for states, institutions, supporters, and most importantly, student ath athletes. I remain concerned that without key safeguards, oversight, and a uh, proper regulatory framework, the, the current NIL market is unstable, and at least student athletes vulnerable. As for the focus of today's hearing, I'm proud to represent colleges and universities of all sizes and athletic affiliation in Pennsylvania's 15th Congressional District, ranging from large Division I programs like Penn State to Division III institutions like the University of Pittsburgh at Bradford, and quite frankly, everything in between. 
While these institutions have many differences, one thing I consistently hear from faculty, staff, administrators, and student athletes are profound concerns over reclassifying student athletes as employees. The cornerstone of college athletics has always been the ability of individuals to earn a college degree while participating in their sport of choice. In fact, even as the NCAA sees record participation in collegiate athletic programs, only a small fraction of student athletes will go professional. A college degree offers students the skills and knowledge to succeed in their careers beyond athletics. Yet the National Labor Relations Board threatens these opportunities for young men and women around the country. Um, Ms. Bodensire, uh, Bodensire I'm, I'm proud to see a fellow Pennsylvania here today, and uh, thank you for being with us. What most people do not understand, as you noted in your testimony, is that most universities, including many large institutions that have successful Div Division I programs, do not generate a profit from their athletic programs. So my first question for you is, if the NR NLRB's decision in the Dartmouth case is upheld and student athletes are classified as employees, what would the financial impact be on college athletic programs? Thank you for your question um, and for your service to our state. I, you know, the college athletics is currently not set up to manage a student athlete workforce. We have 480 student athletes, the administrative and infrastructure that would be required. And as uh, Chairman Gaston Pierce noted, there could be 21 different bargaining units uh, among my 21 sports. And that would be an incredible expense to the institution to try and manage that. Uh, not to mention if there were negotiated benefits as part of that. Um, so I, I think the, the cost to institutions would be great. And, and thank you also for acknowledging at St. Joseph's University, where we do not uh, make a net profit by any means, our coaches are teachers. We are here because you know 95% of women who have reached the C-suite in Fortune 500 were athletes. That's why we're doing what we do. And to change this from the, the teaching, the mentoring, and the developing into a student athlete workforce uh, would be incredibly, uh, go against everything, every reason we support it, uh, but more importantly, would, would cost a lot of money. So can you discuss how universities would react to the increased cost of operating athletic programs, the overhead costs that would be uh, significant, including any potential cuts you see being made? I, I can't speak on behalf of my university, but I think just in talking to athletic directors, I think difficult decisions could have to be made uh, in terms of what sport, how many student athletes is the right number and how many sports you can continue to sponsor to support a student athlete workforce. Well, it seems to me that increased overhead costs will once again become a cost item by which tuition will be uh, re reflected in increased tuition. This is a committee that's been obviously committed to making higher education more affordable, and this is counterintuitive to affordability in higher education. Um, uh, if the NLRB is permitted to treat student athletes who do not even receive athletic scholarships as employees, would that impact other students participating in extracurricular activities such as music, theater, and marching band? If you apply the original director's decision in Dartmouth, I mean, we now have some band and cheer getting scholarships to participate in activities. We have a theory that financial aid is one thing, but financial aid and an invitation to belong is more powerful. Um, and so you could really look at a lot of extracurricular activities under the breadth and scope of the Dartmouth and say that absolutely the pet band members could be employees. They receive gear, they receive lodging when they support our team, and so uh, I believe that they could be considered employees. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. We'll now recognize Mr. Banks from Indiana for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to each of you for being here. I know you've already answered many questions, but Mr. Sims, you have a unique perspective as a labor lawyer and a former college athlete. Um, from your perspective, I, I think you've already answered this, but would college athletics be able to sustain itself if student athletes became employees? Thank you for the question. You know, one of the stats that I included in my written testimony that I think is very powerful is we've already seen how increased costs or uh, less revenue has affected college sports. You have to look no further than, um, than the COVID-19 pandemic issues that, that colleges dealt with. 
And in total, <clears throat> excuse me, 112 Division I sports were cut by 35 schools, and 77 still haven't been reinstated. And between March 11th and November 6th of 2020, a, a total of 352 NCAA sports programs were cut. And the vast majority of those programs were Olympic sports. So um, given your question, given the administrative costs that could come down the line um, and potential increased costs, uh, if you know, a single unit or a couple units were able to uh, bargain for you know, increased compensation or increased benefits, um, I'm concerned that these numbers will start showing themselves again. If student athletes did become employees, could universities implement non-compete clauses restricting them from transferring technically? Thank you for the question. I, I certainly think that's possible. As I discussed previously, uh, collective bargaining um, brings a lot of uncertainty. Um, so whether uh, employees can transfer, um, whether they're not allowed to transfer, we don't know how that's going to play out in a collective bargaining environment. Could student athlete employees be subject to performance reviews? Well, based on my experience uh, in negotiating uh, collective bargaining agreements um, and, and, uh, and dealing uh, directly with labor unions, certainly uh, performance reviews are possible. Um, it, again, depends what's negotiated into the, the collective bargaining agreement. But as I had previously stated, when I played professional hockey for, for three years, I played on nine different teams. I got cut, I got called up, I got sent down. Um, and certainly so, some of those were performance reasons. Um, and you know, those are the type of things that I would expect to see if a university was compensating student athletes for their performance uh, and, and their, their you know, playing proficiency, I could certainly see uh, those type of issues coming up. Could student athlete employees be terminated for poor play or laid off for poor performance? That's certainly a possibility and something that universities would want to include in a collective bargaining agreement, uh, especially if they do agree uh, to certain additional benefits. Um, could be student athletes uh, who are allowed to transfer, uh, could they immediately play for a new school under current rules, they could now. So, yes. So when I but that when could I played, be changed um, if they become student athlete employees. Sure. Under a collective bargaining agreement, the the transfer portal, um, there would be questions about what that would be. Um, right now, they can transfer and immediately play for another school. Um, but if you have a collective bargaining agreement with your school, there may be a provision in there that prevents. Uh, you know, the student athletes from doing it. I imagine the same answer would apply to this. If, if they became employees, could there be a financial penalty for athletes that transfer to another school? Again, that's possible, uh, depending on what's in the collective bargaining agreement. If a student athlete employee was unionized, how would that impact the process of transferring to another school? I, think? I think it would impact it in, in the sense that we talked about that you know, the NCAA currently has the transfer portal where students can transfer freely and play immediately as opposed to sitting out a year, which was the previous rule. Um, and an individual collective bargaining agreement may render that transfer portal uh, ineffective for that. For and and how, many, how many years of eligibility will athletes have as employees? You and I are making the that's, same point. That's a, that's a really good question. I, I, I don't know what the, the years of eligibility would be. Um, would they try to negotiate more than four years of eligibility in a contract? That's possible. They get paid, um, so they might want to stick around longer. Uh, you and I are making the same point. Today, student athletes have a lot of flexibility. And if they become unionized or collective bargaining or under this situation, we're taking away uh, as it seems to me, you can disagree, we're taking away a lot of flexibility from student athletes. Yeah, and it's not only the flexibility, it's the student athletes coming into the school and being potentially subject to that collective bargaining agreement that they never agreed to, right? Um, or choosing not to go to that school because they have a collective bargaining agreement and that school potentially suffering. Seems, uh, like, competitive seems like we're opening Pandora's box. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back. Thank you, we'll now recognize our ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Pierce, thank um, you mentioned the, the case in 1950 uh, where the NCAA defined student athlete. You know, we've argued with this about this to a certain degree in Olympics and in college athletics as well. What is, are they really amateurs or not? Um, so in that case, I found that fascinating. I did not realize 
that what you said in your testimony was student athlete was put in place to protect the institution, the NCAA, from a potential lawsuit from somebody. Could you elaborate on that? And just as from the NLRB's position, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it doesn't seem like it was ever really amateur at some level. Well, well, it was a it was a defensive strategy on the part of the NCAA in the, in the 1950s to preserve it from lawsuits. There was a lawsuit that was filed because of the wrongful death of an athlete who was playing football uh, and and died during the course of that. Um, consequently, uh, this term of art, student athlete, which which stressed the amateurism in order to uh, be able to argue that the, this student was not an employee but a student and therefore they would be escaping liability. Right. It was the concern about liability, not the whole notion of the purity of, uh, of, of amateurism that was the motivating factor in, in, the, in that de determination. And that persi persisted in subsequent litigations where, where, where uh, athletes have, have sued their universities because of the injuries they subsisted. So it wasn't that part of the Alston decision, which was a unanimous decision. The opinion was written by a Trump appointee, uh, Justice Gorsuch. I've already used the quote from Kavanaugh. That's wasn't right. that acknowledging what we've been living under? I mean, from a legal standpoint, the Supreme Court said these are not amateurs. That's right. And the Supreme Court further said that, that collective bargaining is warranted because of the imposition on the lives and livelihoods of these athletes that the NCAA um, creates. So there are a lot of decisions I don't agree with, with the current Supreme Court. So Congress would have to correct it. And this is separate from name, image, and likeness. Would it not? Or could yes. it? That's right. It would only, but we would have to really make it a strict defining line as to what is amateur and what is compensation. I think so. Which, uh, explain to me a little bit about how you would perceive the NLRB dealing with this situation has been expressed, having gone to a private Catholic college and played minor sports. How do you deal with the competition aspect? To some degree, I could see, for instance, in the case of Dartmouth, SEIU representing them, but uh, collectively bargaining in a pattern base for all of the student athletes in the school. How would the NLRB approach that? How, well, would, how would they discern um, who's has standing or not? Well, with respect, I, I, I'm hearing two questions here, because, and I'll answer one, or I'll answer what I understand, if, in case I'm, I'm misunderstanding you. If we're, if we're concerned about a proliferation of bargaining units within a, a, a university, because each... each uh, Actually, excuse me, I'm not. I'm concerned about protecting the, the students. Right. as employees. So you could have uh, SEIU come in and represent all of them with the, with the students agreeing to that. Exactly. And, th and that would be something that the union could, unions could do after they get certified as the exclusive representative. So my question is, what, how would the NLRB approach that? What the NLRB would do is if the unions uh, each have established themselves as the representatives of each of the teams, and they decide to join together as an amalgamation to bargain as a group with the university, the NLRD, NLRB would certainly permit that and recognize that, so the NLRB, just like a multi-employer bargaining right. is permissible. So they would, they would just wait to see what the prospective bargaining units would bring to them. That's right. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes. There's been a lot of misrepresentations or misunderstandings uh, presented today on the true reality of college athletics today and what happens on college campuses, particularly as it relates to our student athletes. Most underprivileged student athletes are on full scholarship as football and basketball players predominantly, and they get many financial benefits beyond tuition, room and board, books, and fees. 
uh, up to in the range of $1,000 a month for full cost of attendance, uh, uh, academic incentives, uh, Pell Grant, and so forth, as has already been noted. Uh, most of the Olympic sports are very expensive to compete in and to get to the level, uh, the travel club level, uh, and there, that requires a lot of parental investment in order to get to the collegiate skill level. And uh, most college student athletes are, in fact, not on scholarship. Let me say it again. Most college student athletes are not on scholarship. And they're willing participants. Uh, and they are the envy of the rest of campus and the envy of their high school teammates who didn't have the ability to continue in college. That is the, that is the reality of the student athletes that we're talking about on a typical college campus. I uh, appreciate all of our witnesses today. Uh, Ms. Bodensteiner, other than football and basketball, we've talked about many times how the other sports uh, don't typically obviously, obviously generate revenue with very rare exception in niche situations. Uh, would you venture to estimate what the cost of employment status might be for the typical D1 university? What would that cost be maybe on a monthly, weekly, annual basis? I haven't thought through it from that perspective, but I can say that adding 400 and athlete, 480 student athlete employees would be a, about the same number of employees we have currently. Uh, so you can assume you'd double your human resources department. Um, and I think the infrastructure would, would be con considerable. Well, I will just give some estimated raw numbers. Let's just say you've got typically 500 student athletes at a D1 school. Let's say you're going to pay them $20 an hour. I don't know if they would negotiate if Mr. Pierce and others had their way for $20 an hour, but let's say it was $20 an hour for 20 hours a week, and they do not work more than 20 hours a week. That's just not, that's a misrepresentation also, by the way. So let's say you had to pay them 400 bucks a week times 500 student athletes. That's $200,000 $200, a week. If you annualize that, and I realize they don't, they're not the full 20 hours a week during the so-called off-season. There's no off-season, but that's some $10 million a year for the typical D1 institution. Uh, what would happen, we've already talked about what happened to women's sports, uh, if that were the case. You know, schools might decide, well, I don't want to pay this amount of money to provide this student-athlete experience for non-scholarship athletes. Uh, but even beyond women's sports, men's Olympic sports would be most impacted. We might decide we don't want golf, we don't want track, we don't want, you know, wrestling, we don't want uh, these other men's sports. But talk, I know you've talked about it some today, but talk about the impact that it might have on women's sports, but also men's sports who don't have Title IX protections. Yeah, I mean, I think the first unfortunate thing would be a trans transforming or transitioning financial aid into the wages. And so I think, again, financial aid provides college access to so many student athletes throughout the country. Um, but, you know, women's sports are largely protected by Title IX, not that everyone follows Title IX uh, and adheres to it. Um, but I think, you know, I do worry about men's and women's sports altogether, as you mentioned, that don't. Um, you know, generate any revenue, which at most schools is several of the sports. And you think about, it's been mentioned here today about the Olympic Development Program, which is really colleges and universities. Uh, our our non-governing boards are USA Swimming's and Fencing's. And so, you know, it really uh, utilize the colleges and universities heavily to prepare Olympians. And I do think some difficult decisions would have to be made. Thank you very much. Mr. Sims, uh, and I think about how most student athletes, or many at least, choose a school because of their teacher, you called it, their coach, their teacher. And how might the impact of employment and unionization harm, like it does every place else where there's a union shop, with management becomes the enemy, management becomes the other, this us versus them mentality. How might it change the relationship between student athletes and their coach if it was a union situation, a union employment situation, do you think? Thank you for the question. I, I valued my relationship with my coaches at Providence. and. One of the concerns I have is how will that relationship change? If something goes wrong, could I go to them for, for help? Or would I have to go to a union shop steward and potentially file a grievance um, that may undermine my coach's authority? Um, and so, you know, th that is one of the things I, I really um, am, am concerned about. And, and I think the relationship between, you know, coaches and players is similar to a teacher and a student. And, you know, I keep in touch with one of my coaches uh, even, even up to today. And, and while, Ms. Bodensteiner, I appreciate what you said a couple times today, hey, you're pro-union. I do not share those pro-union views, but I appreciate that you were still able to articulate how what a really dangerous thing this would be to employ or consider student athletes as employees and therefore to give them the ability to unionize. Uh, so with that, we will move to our closing remarks. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. First, I will recognize Mr. Owens, our chairman uh, from the Higher Ed uh, Committee, subcommittee, for his closing remarks. Thank you, uh, and, and I want to thank all the witnesses. Um, the last two hours, I think we can all agree um, on one thing, 
And I can describe that in two words. This is pure chaos. Uh, how do you destroy a college student athlete model has worked for all these years? Chaos. Uh, why is it that over 100, after 118 years, now that all of a sudden we have the NLRB so concerned about protection, health, safety, and respect for college athletes? That was because of the NIL. There's a lot of money on the table. It has nothing to do with the athlete. It has to do with the fact that it's a very, um, it's a place we can get a lot of income just by unionizing. Now, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna kind of put it as straight as I can. There's an old saying that says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. NLRB, RB, and union bosses say very simply, if it's working, break it. As long as we get paid, keep breaking it. That's what we're looking at right here. And I'm, 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 I'm a product of this process. I went to University of Miami. I got a, a scholarship um, there, graduated biology and chemistry, could not afford to have done that. Did not go there to think I was gonna go to the NFL, just went there to get an education. The benefit was all the other, other serendipities, character, uh, tenacity, grit, understanding ups and downs, multitasking, Mr. Simms, you mentioned that. And there's also that plus factor. The plus factor is if I meet another athlete, I already have a certain amount of respect, particularly I've seen as ups and downs. And there's a plus plus factor if I found out they were wrestlers. So these are things because we understand that character being built being in our process. Guess who doesn't care about that? NLRB and the union bosses. They don't care about, they're not stakeholders, they're not coaches. Uh, they're not there to see how this program falls in and works out for the athlete down the road. They care about the bottom line is how much money can we make off union dues. Um, and we've seen this before. We've seen in the PRO Act, uh, it, it, when, when the market does not uh, push us in the direction, what these guys like to do is force it through legislation. The PRO Act was there simply was make sure that all independent contractors are now employees. Why? Because employees now can get paid union dues. It actually, it was, it was a mess in California where they tried to do it. They had to pull some of it back. Right now we're looking at 18 and 19 year old kids being asked to be employees and to navigate this process of getting an education at the same time trying to figure out how can I make the most out of the time I'm here and how much money, money we can make. This is a way to truly destroy an industry. And I'll say this to the rank and file uh, union members. Uh, just know that there will be a lot of profit in the coffers of the union, but your kids, your son, your daughter, your niece, your nephews, they will in be impacted by this when their programs disappear. So this is an American con conversation. I don't care what side I was sitting on. We want our kids to have the greatest opportunity to, to build them the character we need to have the kind of productive uh, Americans we need down the road. Let's not destroy our athletic programs we have across the country. And every child should have it, whether they're making profits or not. Colleges have figured this out because they're innovative. They know, they know the value. Do not let the union NLRB come in and destroy this because there's so much money now made by the 1% uh, that's coming through this process with NIL. So uh, we're on the right track. Uh, actually, I think from what I've heard from every one of here that we can all agree that chaos is not where we need to go. So let's just be very careful about that. With that, I'll go back. Thank you. I'll now recognize uh, the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Health, Employment, Labor, and Pensions for his closing remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank the, uh, the chair, um, Mr. Owens, as well. And thank you to the witnesses. It's been very thought-provoking. Um, we clearly have challenges. I would disagree with my two friends on a couple of things. Uh, collective bargaining doesn't always end up in chaos. Uh, the vast majority of collective bargaining uh, works out well. These are human guidelines for human institutions if you have a bad employer. And I would say um, the other thing about this is a lot of the students can choose or the workers can choose. They can choose to vote by a majority to whether they want to form a union or not. The vast majority of businesses, particularly small businesses like the ones I manage, uh, they don't unionize, even in states like California where we make it as easy as possible. I think this would actually help that. If you have a good athletic director, a good coach, um, you're gonna work with your students as they come in uh, and it's gonna be a challenge. And I think there is a role for these committees to play to try to figure out what the guidelines are given the Supreme Court's decision uh, in so much that we can come to agreement. Now, one thing I worry about is just the collective benefit to the university, the larger community. Mr. Sims, you alluded to this in your multiple capacities. Um, I have great admiration for Providence, the Friars. Uh, our, our staff here and I used to uh, 
we went to Holy Cross, so we used to go down the road to Providence. So the collective benefit, too, is something we didn't talk about. But I wanted to men just reassert, because we didn't talk, to talk about this, this is a choice. If this continues the way it is, the students, like at Dartmouth and other schools, will choose whether they want to organize or not under the direction. And that's something we haven't spent a lot of time on. However, um, I do think the reality is, is uh, I think I tried to illustrate in our conversation about where student athlete came from, is that there's always been a tension here about what was amateur and what was professional, what generated income, and yes, Mr. Owens has followed the money. There's a lot of money involved uh, more and more as our institutional uh, institutions appear to become more monetized than ever. Um, the NCAA and institutions uh, place a great deal of pressure on college athletes to succeed both academically and athletically. Uh, but even with the pressure, college athletes are still not entitled to the most basic safeguards of health and safety, and that's what we're talking about. If a student athlete gets hurt, should they go in, their family go into their pocket to pay for that damage and the lost income because they won't be able to pursue uh, their athletic career professionally or other careers. That's what we're talking about. A, collect a collective bargaining relationship could help ensure students, in my view, to have a seat at the table when it pertains to their well-being and compensation. And even for students that choose not to collectively bargaining, it puts more pressure on the institutions to work with people honestly uh, and openly. Simply put, despite the assertions we heard today, allowing college athletes to form or have the ability to form, uh, based on their own choice, a union to negotiate for better working conditions would help hold collegiate athletics um, accountable for putting athletes first. Unionization or the threat of unionization or the opportunity is the word I would use for unionization is not the end but rather the beginning of an equitable system and treatment for people who frequently get the short end of the st stick, especially in a multi-billion dollar industry like sports. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize myself for my closing remarks. Today we've heard a lot about how harmful it would be in uh, college athletics if the NLRB succeeds in classifying student athletes as employees. It's abundantly clear the NLRB would rather pander to unions than prioritize the well-being of student athletes. As has been noted, only 2% of student athletes will go pro in their sport. The majority are on campus to get their education while participating in the sport, participating in the sport that they love. Athletics is a wonderful thing for student athletes and for universities. And I don't understand why we would try to destroy that. I don't think the unlimited NIL uh, or the transfer portal, the recent developments uh, that are so consequential, have improved college athletics as we've moved further into the world of rewarding the highest bidder. And we now encourage and reward disloyalty and jumping ship or sending gre greener pasture for student athletes. Today's subject of employment status and unionization presents much more damaging consequences, I would submit. The fact is the majority of student athletes, especially on the men's side, are not on scholarship. They simply compete for the pure joy and love of their sport, the privilege of representing their university, and the intrinsic value of athletics competition. Maybe, as Ms. Bodensteiner said, they want to be part of that 95% of C-suite occupants in the corporate world who are former athletes. And just for example, in the sport of baseball, there's some 35 athletes typically, and you got 11.7 scholarships. In sports like wrestling and soccer, again, 30 or 35 athletes, 9.9 .9 scholarships on the men's side. Track cross country, 12.6 scholarships for huge rosters for track and cross country. Usually you're limited because of Title IX on the men's side, unfortunately. Nothing draws students, alumni, the community to your campus like college athletics. Nothing does. Nothing unites the campus in a common cause or a common spirit like athletic events on campus. That's why you have homecoming, parents weekend, alumni reunions, college for a weekend, all your other recruitment events. They're around athletic contests, typically football and basketball. Nothing markets the school better, brings more pride for those who are associated with the institution like their athletics program. Nothing enriches the college experience like getting the, enjoying the privilege of being a student athlete. And again, nothing builds those character qualities most desired and most key to success in life like getting the privilege of being a student athlete. That said, as I referenced a little earlier, this exploited student athlete is a myth. That is a myth, the exploited student athlete. Typical student athletes uh, who are on scholarship can receive in the range of $1,000 to $1,500 a month in cash benefits, again, beyond tuition, room, board, and books, and fees for a cost of attendance, academic incentives, Pell grants, and so forth. It's also, I, I would like to note that it's a disgrace that one of our witnesses today injected race 
typical into the left's presentation of almost every issue, into this discussion today, claiming that white college administrators are exploiting back black athletes on our college campuses. I think that was a disgrace that that was said today. And if you carry this mindset to its logical conclusion, if we weren't, if, if somehow we were to step back in, in time and we're not gonna permit college, excuse me, black athletes to compete on college campuses, would we be, would be then therefore be sparing them from exploitation? Or would we be discriminated against? Which one would it be? I think it's just terrible that race was injected into that in the way that it was presented by one of our witnesses. As has been said today, the NLRB's decision is a threat to women's sports and even more so to men's Olympic sports. Like forcing an increase in the minimum wage, uh, and some in California are actually proposing a $50 minimum wage there, uh, this would cost jobs, this would cost opportunities for student athletes. Uh, making employment deals with benefit packages would bankrupt and shrink athletic programs since most college sports, again, do not generate revenue. Unionization could force colleges to pay salaries and provide insurance for every student athlete on campus, walk-ons and scholarship athletes alike not to mention the cost of expanding the administration, administrative positions at the university to oversee all of this. I think most student athletes, once they learn about the implications of employment status, strict contracts, filing taxes, more paperwork, and especially limited opportunities, will realize that they should focus efforts on improving the current system, not destroying it. And I hope Congress can take action to protect the freedom of college student athletes and preserve their unique status as both student and competitor. And there be, without objection, there being no further business, the committee stands adjourned.